Good morning. We are so glad you are here with us to worship. We're going to stand up. We're going to stand. I know I'm way over here, and you're like, where is Susan? I can't see her. I'm here. Stand, and we're going to sing praises to our Lord this morning with a shout to the Lord. Shout to the north and the south. Good morning, church. It is great to be with you this morning. My name is House, and I am the student pastor here. If you are a guest with us, it's just a great honor to welcome you. And if you're watching online, we thank you for joining us as well. But it is good to be together this morning to celebrate a risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who loves us, who gave his life for us, who is risen, who is alive, who knows us, and who desires to meet us right where we're at. And so it is a great day to be a believer in the house of the Lord this morning. And so we thank you so much for joining us. A couple announcements for you just to let you know of some things. So this Wednesday, we're not having any of our normal Wednesday activities because it is our fall festival. And so if you haven't signed up for any of the parking spaces or for the chili cook-off, you can do that today. Before you leave, there's a little poster on the back wall. Uh, but a couple important informations for you. Uh, if you have signed up for any of that, try to be on here by 5 o'clock if you can to go ahead and get into your parking space, get things decorated. Decorated. If you are bringing chili and you want it to be judged, it needs to be here no later than 520. The judging will be at 530, and you don't want to miss out on the grand prize of a great certificate and the privilege of knowing that you beat everybody else in the church. Okay, So that goes for a whole year for you. So make sure it's here by 530 so we can get that judged. Uh, and if you are free and you can come and you can help just with setup, uh, help with some of the grilling and the food prep and all that, if you could be here around 5, 515, that would just help us as well. And so we're just continuing looking for volunteers there. And then ladies, don't forget you got your Bible study on Monday, and it is going to keep going until Miss Pam tells you otherwise. So just be uh, aware of that. And then on November the 19th, we are going to have a bake auction. And so it is going to be on Sunday evening, and it is going to be just a, a fun time, one, for you to get some good food. Uh, but two, all the money is going to help with any of the other expenses we have for Guatemala. Uh, and if all those expenses are covered, then we're going to take the extra money, and we're going to give it to the missionaries down there in Guatemala to help purchase maybe another house or even two houses, just depending on how the Lord leads us in that. And so it's going to be a good time for us to be together. But on the back table, there's a sign up. If you are gifted in your baking um, talents and you want to bake a cake or pie or 
big old plate of cookies, whatever it is. Uh, if you'll sign up just so we'll know how much food we'll have and then we'll start advertising that and then it'll be just a fun auction time for us for you to purchase some stuff going into Thanksgiving. And you can even take all the credit and you can say you baked it all. And so that'll be good for you as well and for your family. So that is what we have for this morning, but we are glad to be here and grateful to be with you. Would you join us as we pray? Father, you are the risen Lord, and so we give you all praise and glory and honor because you are the only one who is worthy. You are the creator of heaven and earth. By your very word, you spoke all things into existence. And God, you know us. You call us to be your own. You know everything that we have been through this week. You know our, our fears, our concerns. You know where we have failed. You know all things, God, and you know what we need. We need you. And so we pray that you would just fill this place with your spirit, that you would speak truth into our hearts and lives, that you would meet us right where we are, that you would bring hope, that you would bring conviction, that your word would be active and living as we open it today and as Pastor Don preaches from it. God, that people would turn their hearts to you this morning. And so we thank you for all the opportunities we have to do different ministries together. For our Fall Festival Wednesday, we pray for good weather. We pray the community would come out. We pray you would give us loving hearts to simply reach out to those who are here to encourage them to love on them. God, that maybe we would have opportunities to present the gospel to someone. God, we pray for our bake auction and just for the desire to raise money for our Guatemala trip and for all things that you are already doing in that midst. We thank you for that. Thank you for the ladies' Bible study. Thank you for all the activities that we have going on. You are so good and you are so faithful and the fact that you allow us to be used in your kingdom is humbling, Lord. But right now, in this hour that we have, to simply worship together, to be together, to study your word, to pray, to give. God, meet us in this place. Show your glory. Show your goodness. And accept our offering of praise as we just say that we love you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you would, would you stand as we continue to worship together? We're going to lift our voices this morning. We're going to sing Blessed Assurance.
And sometimes it's good just to hear your voices. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. great promises amen so we get to we get to live in those we get to um, relish in those we get to share those so this morning we're going to take have an opportunity to just celebrate uh, what God has done for us and be obedient in this call of um, the giving of our tithes and offerings so as our ushers come forward let me just lead us in a word of prayer Father, we do thank you so much for your wonderful grace in our lives. And Father, I pray that we would understand um, more and more um, who you are, who you call us to be. And so, Father, in this time, please just uh, allow us to be faithful. Give us hearts that want to um, obey in this area of uh, the giving of our tithes and offerings. Lord, may it come from our hearts. And may we give it with joy. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you all so much. Take your Bibles and open them to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. As we continue to look in this series, as we look at how we are to live in the last days. Because we're in the last days. And the Bible tells us how to live. So that's how we live in the last days. All right, you all can take that to the bank. One thing House forgot to mention, I don't think, or I forgot to hear, was in two weeks our shoe boxes will be due. So don't forget those. We have a lofty goal of 175 shoe boxes filled. So um, it's going to take everybody kind of doing their part and going. But just think about that. 175 kids uh, will be able to not just receive a gift of love. They'll be able to receive and hear the good news of the gospel. And so that's a neat thing, and I am just uh, looking forward to our being able to do that. November 5, I think, is the, uh, the last day. Now, if you don't get them in, then we'll still take them for another week or so. But, um, but for us, we're going to collect them and then may ha have an opportunity to pray over them before they get sent away. But um, again, it's good to be with you, open God's word, um, and I hope everybody is doing okay. Um, it was in his book, My Utmost for His Highest, Oswald Chambers wrote, the best measure of a spiritual life is not its ecstasies, but its obedience. Right? The, the best measure of a spiritual life isn't all of these wonderful experiences that you have, but rather the way you live your life, the obedient life that you live. Now, we've been in this series looking at some of the marks of this Reformation or revival, some call what um, King Josiah uh, was leading for his people um, there in Judah. And last week we saw the... Um, it was a recommitment to Scripture. For 55 years or more, the word of the law had either, either been hidden or ignored until the high priest Hilkiah found the scrolls while he was looking for something else in the temple. And when Josiah realized what it was, he tore his clothes as a sign of, uh, of grief or sorrow. And, and he was heartbroken, not that... Um, the word was found, but that it had been lost and forgotten in the first place. So what do you do now? And, and that's what we're going to look at today. I want you to uh, look. We're going to, I'm going to read verses 29 to 33. Ask if you would stand with me. Let me read this passage. Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 29. It says, so the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all of the men of Judah, all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, all of the people, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all of his heart and all of his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus, Josiah removed all the abominations from all of the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. And we'll stop there. Pray with me. Lord, please help us to understand, Father. Just grant us grace today. Lord, we know that you have a desire for our lives. Help our hearts to be, to line our desires up with yours. 
Lord, we are living in the last days. We see so much going on around us. Father, it's not that you're calling us to do anything different, but simply to be obedient in what you have called us all along to do. Help us with that, Father, by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Josiah doesn't waste any time. He knows what has to be done, right? So he gathers all these people together, all the people of Judah, all the people of Jerusalem, that um, anybody that could come. It didn't matter whether you were a somebody or a nobody. Um, he wanted you to hear the word of God. And so everybody gathered at the temple, and it says he read in their hearing the word of the book of the covenant. Now, when he finished reading, he wasn't done because he wanted to make sure that all the people, uh, that he did what was right before the Lord and before his people. And, and so he declared that intent. He reaffirmed his commitment to the covenant, to that um, promise to keep and obey the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Then he made everybody else do the same thing. And so when we get to verse uh, 33, you find that summary down there. All his days, they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. Now, I, I will be honest with you and tell you that um, I struggled with whether to make this two parts or not, but I, I ended up doing that because I think this is a significant thing for us to look at. And, and so we'll see that the next step in Josiah's revival and Josiah's reform was obedience. Reading the word isn't enough. Even loving the word isn't enough. Somewhere, somehow, we have to make the commitment to obey the word of God. God didn't just give us his word so we could understand it or so we could debate it. He gave us his word so that we could obey it, right? So, so that's the next characteristic of revival is a commitment to obedience. This is that mark of revival, a commitment to obedience to the word of God. That's a central theme throughout all of scripture God's call for us to obey, right? And, and, and we obey God, not just with our actions. Most of the time when we think of obedience, it's something that we do, right? But it's not just with our actions, but rather we obey God even in our attitudes, even with our approach to everyday life. It's not just about what we do or we don't do, but it includes how we think. We can be disobedient to God in our thoughts, in our thought patterns, right? And the way we think what we let into our minds, the way we think about other people. So obedience flows out of this heart commitment to God and his word. Now, there are uh, tons of ways to go, but I just want to share a few things about this issue of obedience today. Number one, we glorify God when we walk in obedience. When we walk in obedience, when we obey God, we are giving Him glory. We are bringing glory to Him. You've heard that saying, I, I've said it a lot of times, what is it? He's God, we're not, right? Y'all got that? Let's practice. He's God, yeah, right. Well, glad y'all got that. Well, nothing says that better than his children walking in obedience. Right? We can sing it, we can say it, we can study it till the cows come home, but obedience is living it. Every time we choose to obey the Lord, we are giving him glory because we are expressing that he is worthy of our obedience. And, and I'll tell you, I'm the father of two grown daughters. So, uh, but when they were smaller, it would give me a tremendous sense of honor and respect when they would obey me. 
without my having to tell them a second or third or fourth time. But when, when I asked them to do something and they would respond with the right spirit, it blessed me because, and, and really I felt a sense of honor because um, it, it showed that they loved me and they respected my authority, whether they understood all of the reason for what I was asking them to do or not. And every parent understands what I'm talking about on that reason part, but it's in, in much the same way we honor God, we bless God by obeying Him. When we, when we love and trust Him enough to do what He calls us to do. And, and by the way, this isn't about God being on a power trip. Right? Rather, obedience is about what's best for us. He made us. He loves us. He, he seeks a relationship with us. And because God knows and wants what's best for us, we know that we can trust Him and obey His commands. I mean, think about it. We have a, we have a real-life example that we live every day. All you have to do is go back to the book of Genesis. Go back to the Garden of Eden. God's best, God's blessings were given to Adam and Eve, and, and, and all they had to do was just obey. They could have everything, just, just do what God had told them that they needed to do. But, but rather than obey God, rather than live in the blessing of that obedience, they chose disobedience. Right? And, and because they chose disobedience, instead, we are living in the results of all of that disobedience. So every day when we wake up and, and um, when your back hurts or whatever, it, it is a reminder that obedience is best. And, and is a reminder that disobedience can, can bring much difficulty in our lives. And so we've known that from the very beginning, God's best for his people is found in obedience. Number two, we solidify our life when we walk in obedience. And I, I know that I've mentioned this a couple times or a lot in the last few weeks, but we keep going back to that passage in, in Matthew 7 when Jesus is finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. Right? If you, if you think about it, Jesus gives all sorts of reminders as he comes to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount about the significance of not just hearing what he says, but obeying. And he talks about the person who hears what he said and then does it, obeys it, is going to be like that wise man who builds his house on the rock, on a solid foundation. The one who hears his words but ignores them would be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And so the point is this. When the storms would come and the winds would rage and the rain would fall, that the house built on the rock would stand firm while the house built on disobedience would fall apart. So it just follows that obedience brings stability in our lives. Because friends, let me tell you, the storm is going to come at some point in some way. So what's going to stabilize us? What's going to give us that rock solid foundation, that direction on what to do and how to respond? Well, it's going to be the Word of God. right? The Word of God. But hearing it, isn't going to be enough to say, I know the Word of God, isn't going to be enough. Somewhere we need to choose to obey it, to follow it. And that's building our lives on a solid foundation. James reiterated the very same thing when he said, you need to be a doer of the Word and not just a hearer only. Because knowing without doing is not even real faith. I mean, he said, even the demons believe and tremble. But, but there is another thing we need to understand when we talk about solidifying our lives. God's, God-centered obedience brings blessing. An obedient life will be a blessed life. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying that. 
Scripture teaches that. There are times when God gives conditional commands. If you do this, I'll do this. Now, that doesn't mean if you obey God that you'll always be rich and never be sick and, or ever have a problem. Job teaches us that sometimes those blessings aren't going to be immediately obvious. And, and we need to understand that God's blessings are not always bound to this life. Right? Jesus makes sure we understand that there are riches and blessings and treasures that will be waiting for us to enjoy forever, not just for a few years while we're here. And, but, but I'll say this, and sometimes I, I'm looking over here to these guys, um, these students. I, I think there you can ask, and there'll be a number of people here who will tell you there is a blessedness in obeying God, whether it's in adversity or in prosperity. There is a, there is a not just a blessing, but a, a, a blessedness, if you will, about obeying God. You see, because here, here's the thing, the more you care about the things of God, the more you will realize that those blessings don't have to be earthly blessings. See, obedience isn't a token that you stick in some divine vending machine so that you can pull out a prize. I mean, that's a that's a contradiction of faith in some ways, doing spiritual things in order to get a temporal blessing. But the more you obey, the more you understand that many times the blessing is in the obedience. It is in the obedience itself. And the more you obey Him, the more you'll understand why you want to obey Him. So when we, when we walk in obedience, it glorifies God, it solidifies our faith, and thirdly, I mean our life, thirdly, it verifies our faith. Uh, James talks about that, right? Faith without works is dead, being alone. So uh, how do we know our faith is real? We, we know it's real by the obedience in our lives. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, again, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Right? In other words, there's more than just calling Jesus Lord. We need to live it out in our obedience. In the way we, we respond and react and the, in the way that we make decisions and, and, and make choices. Walking in obedience is walking in faith. But let me, let me put it another way. Walking in faith is walking in obedience. And so, before I finish, which is probably the word y'all were looking for, but um, let me just share a couple things about what obedience is not. All right, just so if I can, maybe this will be helpful, maybe not, but obedience is not meant to be like paying taxes. Okay, obedience is not meant to be like paying taxes. C.S. Lewis used that illustration. He said, sometimes we can be like honest but reluctant taxpayers. We know that we need to pay our income tax, and we do. We don't necessarily like it, but we pay it, and, and we're always afraid of a tax increase. We're always afraid that something more will be asked of us, and, and we only pay the minimum due, and, uh, and that's just because it, we have to. And, and he said that obedience given to God with the same attitude as paying our taxes is not genuine obedience at all. It's kind of, we'll do it, but we don't necessarily want to do it. Now, I know there's some people who, who chafe at this issue of obedience. I, no, I, I just, I've got to be free. I want to be free. Um, but let, let's, let's be honest this morning. You, you don't struggle with the issue of obedience. 
right? Because what you're really struggling with is who or what you're going to obey. The, the struggle isn't with obedience by itself. You're either going to obey God or you're going to be a slave to sin. Right? That, that, that's it. Sin would be your master. So really, what you've got to decide is who has your best at heart and who is worth following. So it's not like paying taxes. Number two, obedience is not just a way to look good before others. Man, you want to talk about somebody who had this obedience thing down pat. It was the Pharisees, right? But what did Jesus do? He called them out for misunderstanding and misrepresenting what obedience really was. Because what happened was they began to look at their goodness based upon how they compared with everybody else. And how did they compare with everybody else? What made them good was that they were obedient to the law. And all of a sudden, they became a little prideful and self-righteous. And um, they would look around and realize how good they were compared to other people around them. And, then, and so then they, became, they, they began to come up with more rules because the more rules that they could follow, the gooder and gooder they would look. Until one day they woke up to find that they didn't love the law because they loved God. It was because obedience to all those laws made them look good. And so they began to love the law of God more than they did God himself. So we have to be very careful because that can happen, especially... In, in, in the church, that we don't become legalists who love good deeds more than we love God. And here's the last one I want to share that what obedience is not. Obedience is not a substitute Savior. Obedience is not a substitute Savior. Heaven is not one with obedience. We're not saved by good works. It is not, obedience is not a, uh, a, a means to this end. The rich, rich young ruler thought that his rule keeping ought to get him to heaven, but it, it wouldn't and it won't because here's the thing, we're all sinful. We're all disobedient ones. I mean, actually, that's a good definition of a sinner, somebody um, who is disobedient to God. I mean, you, you go through, uh, th through the history of Scripture, Adam was tempted and failed. Israel was tempted and failed. We've all been tempted and failed. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it is this disobedience in our lives that separated us from God. And that's why Christ took on humanity. Hebrews 2 said, Now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death. That is, the devil. Jesus is the obedient one. He obeyed the Father so that you and I, the disobedient ones, could find forgiveness and the cleansing for our disobedience and be brought into God's forever family. And we can't forget that. We don't obey to earn our way into heaven. It's not a substitute savior. And again, there's hundreds of other things to say. But it boils down to our obedience is a response to the love of God in Christ. Right? It's, it's born out of God's authority and God's love. We obey because God is great. And God is good. When he was in the upper room with his disciples, Jesus um, told them, told them this. He said, if you'll love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Then, then just after that, he said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. 
And then just after that again, he said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He does not love me, does not keep my words. So obedience is the fruit of our relationship with Christ. Right? It's, it's more than snapping to attention and saying, yes, sir. The fruit of obedience grows out of our relationship with Christ. I mean, in that upper room, there was a disciple, John. John figured it out. He wrote in 1 John, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So the story of obedience is really, it's a story of God's grace. When we understand that we're chosen, and that we're loved beyond our wildest imagination, then it draws us to love him in return. And when you love him, it changes everything. You want to live a life of obedience. But not only do you want to live a life of obedience, you'll begin to disdain a life of disobedience. Now, you'll have choices. You'll always have choices, right? That's, that's what obedience is. It's choosing to do what God's word calls us to do, choosing to honor God than pleasing self. And, and there is a there's a great blessing in obedience itself. Each act of obedience, whether it is um, whether it's second nature or a conscious choice that you make, deepens your love for Christ. And it makes the things that are precious to him become all the more precious to you. So, uh, Nancy DeMoss gave three simple questions, listed three questions I think are worth repeating, as in, what do I do now? Is there something I know God wants me to do that I've not yet done? Is there something I know God wants me to do that I've not yet done? Maybe it's forgiving. Maybe it's showing hospitality. Maybe whatever it is. Number two, am I continuing to do something that I know God wants me to stop? Am I continuing to do something I know God wants me to stop? And number three, have I placed limits on what I'm willing to do for God? Have I placed any limits on what I'm willing to do for God? God, I'll obey you, but. You know, that renewing of the covenant that Josiah did wasn't new. You go back to Exodus when God gave that to Moses. And he had the people make their commitment. And they said, we will obey the Lord. When there was a new generation ready to go into the promised land, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses had the people renew their commitment to the covenant. When they got a foothold in the promised land, Joshua had the people renew their commitment to the covenant, obeying the Lord. And then um, after Babylon, after what we've read here, after um, that exile, and they came back and they rebuilt the wall around the city, Nehemiah had them recommit themselves to that covenant. Now, one of the things that that just showed me is this. There are times when we need to stop and just reboot our commitment to obedience. But here's the deal. It's really not from event to event like we saw 
It really is day to day. And moment by moment, committing ourselves to being men and women of obedience, doing what God calls us to do, obeying what His Word teaches us in how we act, in how we think, and how we react to people. And, and you know, I, lo I love that statement there in verse 33. Wouldn't it be great to be said all our days we did not depart from following the Lord our God? I don't know. Maybe you'd say, oh, God doesn't want anything to do with me. I've been so disobedient. But you know what? You can let that disobedience drive you to the one who loves you and provides a way of deliverance from that. Out of your disobedience, because he is provided through the obedient one. Christ, who died on cross who lived the life we couldn't live died a death that we couldn't die so that we could find eternal life and forgiveness and hope in him and, and and you understand jesus said god's like the father in the parable of the prodigal son waiting for that disobedient child to come home god's waiting for you to get that point to get to that point the challenge is to come home and let him show you his forgiveness today. So I'd ask if you would just to bow your heads with me in a time of prayer. Let me ask these three questions again. Is there something in your life that you know God wants you to do but you've not done it yet? You need to commit today to taking care of that. Or if you can do it right there where you are. Are you continuing to do something or thought pattern that you know God wants you to stop. And have you placed any limits on your obedience to God? Would you just respond to the Lord about that? I don't know if this makes sense, but my, my prayer is that we would just have a different understanding of obedience. As we see what it does and what it isn't, that we would, we would understand that in that relationship with such a precious Savior who loves us so much that we would find the blessedness and the blessing in obeying. Or maybe today you have, you've, you've been that disobedient one and God just wants to tell you I love you I've been waiting for you to come home because I want to forgive you and restore you Maybe you just need to come to faith in Christ today. 
then I invite you to come. Just open your heart. Just get honest with him. Say, Lord, I know I need you. I know that it's my disobedience that's separated. I've been selfish. I, I do my own thing, and, and I've never turned to you. And I understand it, and I accept your death and resurrection as payment for my sin. And I want to turn from going my way, and I want to follow you. Please come in and be the Lord of my life today. Father, I give this time to you. Just work in the way that you um, see fit. And Father, just uh, teach us all how much you love us. And that what you call us to do is for our best and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As every Sunday, we sing this hymn of invitation. It's a time to respond if you want to come here and use these steps as an altar. If you want to know more about joining the church, if you want to know more about what it means to follow Christ and to, to receive him, then I invite you to come today. If right where you are, you just need to settle the issue, um, then you can stop singing right where you are and just pray and ask God to to deal with you and whatever that issue is. But we're going to stand, begin to sing, and I invite you to come.
not an easy topic to talk about obedience. It's like, who am I, right? But we have a God who loves us, who has provided for us in Christ. And it's like, should we not? How can we not? Pray for one another. May our hearts be obedient in everything we say, in everything we do, how we think, how we act. We have a lot of things going on this week, um, especially Wednesday night, tomorrow, Ladies Bible Study, Wednesday night, Fall Festival. Hope you can come just to welcome folks and let them see who we are and that we do care about them. And so House has given you all the, all the details on that, and so we'll let that stand. But let me lead us in a word of prayer, and we will go. Father, thank you so much for that love. I pray for these folks, Lord. We all look to you and pray that you give us a heart of obedience, a desire, Father, to live like that, to, to know your word, to respond in faith, and to do and to go and to be according to your will. Just give them good things as we pray in Jesus' name today. And all the people said, amen. amen. God bless you.